Welcome everyone to 20 Years Later Lessons Learned from reporting on September 11th, 2001. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join us today virtually for this special event. My name is Kelsey Sibley and I'm the program coordinator for the Riley Center for Media and Public Affairs. Before we get started, a few housekeeping points. First, only our speakers will be unmuted for today's conversation. If you have questions during the panel discussion, please submit those using the chat function in the panel at the bottom of your screen. We have built in a little bit of time at the end of today um, to answer some of those questions. So the LSU Riley, team, Riley Center team has worked really hard to continue to adapt our programming with the ever changing circumstances um, surrounding COVID. And I wanna extend special thanks to everyone on our team for their flexibility and their commitment to the Riley Center's mission. Um, today, we are excited to welcome the Manship School's very own Dr. Judith Sylvester and Dr. Suzanne Huffman to moderate this discussion commemorating the 20th anniversary of September 11th. Dr. Sylvester is an associate professor at the Manship School and served as founder and director of the Media Research Bureau at the University of Missouri School of Journalism. She's the former news editor of the Missourian Weekly and the Family Missourian. She's a longtime member of the National Federation of Press Women. Her interests include research methods, civic journalism, healthcare campaigns, and social marketing. Dr. Suzanne Huffman, worked as a television news reporter and anchor for 10 years, and then taught broadcast journalism at the university level for 25 years. She earned her BA with honors from Texas Christian University, her MA from University of Iowa, and a PhD from the University of Missouri. She's the co-author of Broadcast News Handbook, Reporting from the Front, and along with Dr. Sylvester, she co-authored the book that inspired today's conversation, Women Journalists at Ground Zero, Covering Crisis. And our panel is going to feature some of those women from the book to reflect the lessons, to reflect on the lessons they learned 20 years ago, 20 years after the September 11th terrorist attacks. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Sylvester and Dr. Huffman. I will turn it over to you two. All right, um, thank you. And I really appreciate the family and friends and especially the students who have um, signed in to see this. And I know uh, we'll get a lot more people looking at the, um, the recording of it uh, later on as well. Um, and I wanna say that we have with us today three uh, very remarkable women, well, actually five if you count Suzanne and me, um, who really covered, um, put, put our efforts together to cover the real story of what was happening on the day of 9-11. And the 20th anniversary, of course, was last fall. And um, I want to point out to you that this is the 20th anniversary in March of our book being published. So for those of you who are journalists, we really, really put this book together very quickly. Um, and it started with uh, when I was taking my kids to school and had the radio on and, oh, yeah, some plane might have hit the World Trade Center. And what did that mean? And I dropped my kids off at school and by then I was like, this is going to be a news story. So I ran home and put every tape I had in the VCRs that I had at home. And then I actually had a class that day. So I went on to LSU and I had a little portable TV that you could then plug in, didn't have to be connected to anything. Um, and my class actually watched the towers fall. And it was pretty horrific. And um, one of my students actually, her father was in New York and she ran out of the room in tears and just all kinds of things were going on. And when I got home that night, I was looking at some of the tape and I kept seeing women all over, women covering it, you know, women being the people that were on the ground at all three of the locations. And um, I sent an email to Suzanne and I said, hey, um, have you noticed how many women are covering this? And Suzanne wrote back and said, we should do a book. So Suzanne, why don't you tell them why you thought we should do this book? That morning, I had driven into work. And by the time I got to my office, all the televisions were on. So we just watched television all day. Um, classes were, um, they still met, but it consisted of watching television. Um, 
So like Judith, I was struck by how many women were covering this because I was in the seventh grade um, when John Kennedy was assassinated. And I remember those four days, my mother said we were gonna watch television at home because this was history. And it was black and white then, and it was all men covering everything. So I noticed on September 11th, there are a lot of women. And I was watching the television coverage and one of the women who worked for ABC, I just noticed as time went on, she has on the same clothes and her hair is starting to look like she hasn't like fixed it because she had never left the point where she was inside the perimeter um, because she was afraid if she left, she wouldn't get back. So that's why she was wearing the same clothes and she would just kind of spiff up a little bit wherever she could. So I was struck by all that. And um, so Judith and I talked that night and it's like, let's, let's get these women's stories on the record. Um, as a little aside, um, women are not represented in the literature um, as robustly as their male uh, counterparts. And I was actually in a meeting a year or two before this happened where somebody brought that up and said, why is that? And the answer was that women don't ever do anything. So that kind of stuck with me. And uh, Judith and I talked about it and it's like, uh, yes, they do. And um, let's write it down and make sure their stories are in the record. So that's what we did. And the women were very gracious about um, telling us how it was to actually get the work done. Because as professors, we try to train our students, but there's really no way to train them for that. And one of my first jobs after um, after the PhD program was at the University of Arkansas. And I'd had this student in my class and her first job was in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And practically her first story was the school shooting there. So um, again, it's like, how do you do this work? What can we tell our students about how to prepare to do this work? And, um, you know, to lean on the basics because you can't trust the technology. Rahima Ellis had one videotape that day. That was it. Um, and, you know, cell phones were working and all these things. It's like you can't depend on the technology always. So a lot of that came across in the book. And it was a way to explain to students. It's like, you know, the basics still work. And um, we picked that up from all the sharing that the women did with us about how they did the work that day. So. Yeah, and I might add that they did it very professionally. They really relied on their professional training and I'm sure the women here will tell us that uh, in a bit. Uh, another thing too is that we'll, we'll talk about um, maybe a little bit is the technology and how much how it's changed. Um, but it was kind of on the cusp right then and cell phones were out there and digital cameras were out there um, but there were problems with them working. Um, and so there were all sorts of, of things that some of the old technology, like pay phones, had to still be used um, to get the stories completely there. And I want to say, too, that um, we did, I did ask Rahima Ellis to join us today, and she wasn't able to do that, but she's still reporting uh, in the education field for NBC. Um, and also, we had two people in Washington, D.C., which was um, Judy Woodruff and Leslie Foster. And they both uh, are still working in, in DC, but they had schedule issues um, as well. So we don't actually have a representative from, um, from DC today, but uh, we do from the other areas. So I actually want to start with Emily and I'll let Emily introduce herself and, and talk about it a little bit. But I want to say Emily was the youngest person in our book. Um, and so she was um, really cut her teeth on this story. And um, so I'll let her tell you how that has, um, how her career has gone since then. So Emily. 
Well, thanks for thanks for having me, uh, Suzanne and Judith. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I um, my name is Emily Longnecker. I'm a reporter at Channel 13 in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, but on September 11th, I was a young reporter um, at uh, WTAJ TV, Channel 10 in uh, Altoona, Pennsylvania. So I like to say that um, I was a baby reporter on that day. Uh, I was only in my second reporting job. I started in Elmira, New York uh, market, I think 175 at the time. Um, so I had only been reporting three years and here this um, national international tragedy was unfolding right uh, in our backyard. And um, that morning, I mean, I was home like everyone else getting ready to come into work and um, saw this plane hit the tower, uh, the first tower and thought, oh my God, what is this? And then as I, I, I mean, I was getting ready, I knew this is, you know, this is insane. What are we doing? And so I was throwing everything in a bag and just, I needed to get to work. My phone started ringing. And as I was walking out the door, the second plane hit, um, got to work. And then um, a plane hit the Pentagon. And at that point, uh, they had me working on um, trying to talk to a mother whose son was in one of the towers in New York. So I was on the phone trying to, to locate this mother. And we heard on the scanner, um, if you remember, they ordered all the planes down um, on the ground at that point, and we heard on our scanner in the newsroom this discussion about this plane that they um, had lost contact with or had cut off contact with, and they were, they were trying to get this plane um, down on the ground. They weren't sure what it was doing. It was coming um, from Cleveland, and we all, I remember, we all kind of looked at each other in the newsroom and thought like, nah, you know, this is, this is not part of this. This is probably just a plane that's confused or isn't sure where to land. And um, so I, I left out the door with a photographer to um, go talk to this mother who was waiting for word about her son. And in the meantime, then uh, it was flight 93 that, uh, that crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, which was about an hour away. Um, and that first day, they actually did not send me to the site. And I remember just um, in my in my heart, you know, I think when you're in when you're in news and, in, and it's in your blood, you want to go, you want to be where everything is happening. Um, so they sent um, a male colleague of mine. Um, and so he went down first. Uh, and so I remember, you know, wanting to be there. But then I also had this sense that I needed to, to talk to this mother, like her, her story was just as important. She was waiting for word uh, from her son. And um, thank God he was, you know, he, he got out um, safely, but they sent me the next day to um, basically my job was to touch base with the family members that were coming in. So that's what I did for the next week. I was uh, at a, um, sometimes I was at the site and then they would shuttle me, we would drive over to this um, resort that they had, I think it was called Seven Springs where they were bringing family in. And uh, it was a pretty controlled situation there. Um, and I was thankful for that because I remember thinking, how am I gonna go talk to these people who have just lost people they love in this horrific, unbelievable way. Um, so we were in a, a conference room of sorts and family, if they wanted to come in and talk to us, they could. So um, sometimes I was there getting family and then other times I was also um, at the site, um, you know, when uh, the governor Tom Ridge at the time came and, and um, and just updating on the investigation. So I was there for about a week, but, um, you know, didn't know we would be there for the long haul. And I just remember being in the same clothes for a few days and uh, just, you know, finally going to the local Walmart. Um, but uh, it was an unbelievable time for me. And just as a young woman um, and, and, and just a young person, a young American, I mean, I would call my mom at night and, you know, have to process a little bit and cry a little bit. Cause I, I mean, just as a human being, I mean, putting the reporter Part of me aside, I mean, I knew I had to focus and get a job done, and I did. But then also, you know, I was young and um, wondered how my family was, and I had all of these thoughts going through my head about all of the people I love um, as I was watching these people grieve the people that they loved. So, so Emily, you and I talked about this a bit. You're uh, reporting now in um, uh, Indianapolis. Yes. Um, and you mentioned to me that that you had really carried some of that experience or expertise, I guess you could even say, into uh, covering COVID patients and parents and people. You want to talk about that just a little bit? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, anytime you're 
you're approaching people who've lost someone they love in, in an unbelievable tragic way. I mean, I think your first job is just to approach it as a human being and um, you really have to bring some empathy to the table. And so, I, I mean, before 9-11, I had, I, had, I had spoken with people who had, who had lost people, but I think covering that tragedy on such a mass scale, um, I don't know, it left me with something in my heart that I, I always wanted to make sure that I was, you know, respectful of people as much as you want to um, get the story and hear from people and hear from people who are experiencing it firsthand. Um, I never, um, you know, wanted to come off like I was being a vulture or uh, taking advantage of anyone's pain. So, I, I mean, I always kind of carried that with me. And, 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 and over the years, I mean, in local news, you do cover a lot of, a lot of tragedies, a lot of people who've lost people to, to different things. And so, um, you know, this, these past two years in covering COVID, you know, I've, I, my gosh, I've talked to many people who've lost people they love to, to the virus in, in, in terrible ways. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I still, I think I always approach it as a human being first. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's important um, just to, to bring empathy to the table and to try and put yourself in their shoes. So I think that I've covered that with me. I think it shaped how I, I approached the job, at least when I was dealing with people who had suffered great loss, certainly. Okay. All right. So, um, Beth, I went to um, move to you, and you were um, in New York City, and you actually worked um, at a radio station, public radio station, that was really very close to ground zero. So do you want to um, experience or talk about that a bit? Sure. I was a reporter for WNYC Public Radio, and I was preparing to cover the mayoral primary that night because Rudy Giuliani was term limited. We were having an election on September 11th, and I was going to be at the uh, headquarters of the candidate who was most likely going to win that night and planning to sleep late. And then my boss woke me up <laughs> um, just before nine o'clock to tell me that he needed me to cover this fire at the World Trade Center and I better get down there soon. And he rattled off the names of other people going there. And because I was so caught up in this mayoral race and because there had been some weird incident involving somebody who tried to like paraglide or somehow like land on the Statue of Liberty a few months earlier, I thought this is just some little propeller plane incident. So I said, can't you get someone else to cover that? And he says, no, we need you. And I, it wasn't dawning on me what had happened at all. I heard somebody on the air on my radio station describing watching an explosion who wasn't a reporter. And it turns out that was a person who worked for WMYC in one of the other departments like sponsorship or membership because they had a window view from our building, which at the time was in the Manhattan Municipal Building, just about four blocks away from the Trade Center. And that person had seen the plane, the first plane go into the first the Southern Tower. And so I'm hearing this very strange description of something that I'm still really not processing. And I turned on the television and I saw at that point, I don't know if it was one or both towers that had been hit, on CNN and, you know, again, like I'm a little slow here at this point figuring out what's happened, but that's when I thought, okay, I better run. And I ran out my door and I was living in Greenwich Village just exactly a mile north of the Trade Center at the time. And on my street, everybody was filling this little street to look south and see the two towers with the orange flames coming out of these black holes and smoke and this beautiful blue sky. And so it was silver, blue, black, and orange. It was like a surrealist painting. And you're looking at something that's so horrifying, but you also know that there's something just that's pulling you because it's so unreal. And I ran to the subway and I probably caught the last train that was going downtown before they turned the mall off. And I, it was just a couple of subway stops. And when I came out of the train station, there was all this stuff in the air. It was, um, I mean, paper, concrete, who knows? At, at that point, it was probably a lot of paper and other debris. And I was running to see where the mayor was because he had a 
emergency command center that at the time was across the street from the World Trade Center. Police officers were telling me, don't go there. It's really dangerous. There's a lot of glass falling. And as if I was trying to get there, because it was just a few blocks, but the whole street was packed with people staring up. I saw that the the South Tower looked like it was starting to get a little shorter, but I thought maybe I'm just seeing some optical illusion with all the smoke. And I am trying to cross to get as close to it as I could. At that point, I was maybe three blocks away. And a female police officer stopped me and said, you cannot go any further. And I got indignant and showed her my press pass and I had my microphone. And, and she said, I'm doing this to save your life. And just as she said that, the South Tower collapsed. So I started recording it and narrating what I was seeing and then realized everybody's running, so I better run too. And I captured the whole sound of all these people running away from it and screaming. And it was, it was such chaos. And I'm so lucky that I ran into one of my colleagues, Marianne McCune. She was also just trying to get down there and, and do as much reporting as she could after leaving the campaign stop of somebody who was running for mayor. And we spent that whole morning together trying to do a job that we had not ever done before. You know, I'd once covered a plane crash, but I've never covered something like that. Nobody had. And by some miracle, her cell phone was working. We were able to get through to our on-air studio. Our morning edition anchor stayed with a producer and another person to keep the station on the air. They refused to leave, which was the right thing to do, even though the building had been evacuated because it's just a few blocks away. And we brought survivors, witnesses to the phone to give their account. We were just making it up as we went along. You know, what would I want to hear if I was tuning into the radio? And then the second tower fell as we were live on the air. And I could, I knew what was happening as soon as I felt the shaking in the ground. It was just like with the first one. So I, I thought, uh oh, it's happening again. And we saw it go down. But it was so smoky and there was not much that we could say. You know, it's it's a very helpless feeling when you're alive and your anchor is asking, tell me what's happening. What do you see? And he has a better view of it on the television than I have because I'm there surrounded by smoke. And we did what we could. We kept interviewing more people who were there. And then we split up after a while and I went and walked all the way to um, Mayor Giuliani's first press conference. We, Marianne and I had gone into the health department building nearby and asked them if we could use a desk and a phone so that we could get back on the air with WMIC and with NPR. And we just took turns reporting for each. And then I, I went uptown about 20 blocks. She stayed downtown. She stayed in that perimeter. So she didn't want to lose her spot. And I know that I stayed up the whole night after I went to NPR's bureau in Midtown. I, I have this memory of her. She was on roller skates and she came up town. She dropped off some mini discs for me so that I could do a whole piece with the sounds of everything that we captured that day for Morning Edition. And then she went back town, back downtown and she managed to stay, you know, camped out in that perimeter. And the next few days were just, horrific because in addition to watching and seeing all these things that were so upsetting, I'm also experiencing in a different way than anything else I've ever reported on because it's my city. It's my work neighborhood. It's close to where I live. I was below 14th street. So I couldn't take a taxi home from NPR. I had to walk part of the way. And it was just to see the city affected like this and all these military vehicles and people crying and donations and all the signs up for people looking for their missing loved ones, going to a hospital, interviewing people outside who had this hope that maybe their missing person would show up in a hospital when that was not going to happen. Um, it was very, very upsetting. But I think just doing the job is what got me through it. Because when I stopped and was given two days off in a row, after about five days, I did not know what to do with myself. And I couldn't turn off the TV. You know, you feel like you're just plugged into this news crisis 24 seven, and there was no way to create any distance. And it was, it was unhealthy for all of us. My whole newsroom, we were much smaller at the time than we were when I left last year, but we just had to be around the clock, all of us. And our news director having worked in 
the Jerusalem Bureau for NBC was very conscious about dividing the labor, making sure people had two days off because he'd been through a lot of bombings and things like that. But, you know, we had never been prepared for anything like that. So it was, you know, talk about having to grow up overnight and learn a whole different job. You just do it by improv. Yes. Um, and then, um... And we'll come back and talk about, you know, why you've changed jobs and how it's affected you since then. But I want to move on um, to Gomera and um, let her introduce her, herself. And, um, and let me just preface this by saying uh, hers was one of the most gripping stories uh, that I heard because she was just so close to it. And, um, and all of those, you know, just things that happen. And um, she was seeing everything through the eyes of a photographer. So I will let you explain what you were doing and, and how you um, very bravely went out and got some of the iconic pictures from, from that time period. I thank you. Uh, I'm Gulnara Samuelova. Um, I'm a street and fine art photographer, also founder of Women's Street Photographers, and I just published my first book. Um, on 9-11, I was a, a staff a photo editor and photo retoucher for the Associated Press. And I also lived uh, four blocks away from the World Trade Center. Uh, when um, yeah, I was also asleep in my apartment um, and what I, when I wake up, I woke up from all the sirens because where I used to live, there was a, a hospital and then um, um, fire station and the police plaza. So all this nonstop sirens um, made me turn the TV, uh, TV on. And I saw the first tower is um, on fire. And as I'm watching TV, I see the second plane hit the second tower and I hear it at the same time. And after that, I immediately um, took my camera and I also was just like running around the apartment thinking like do I need the flash and um, it was such a beautiful morning with blue skies and um, so I took all my film and camera and I just run towards the uh, World Trade Center. I didn't know what kind of planes they were inside um, so I just did not think about the, 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 the danger. And when I got there, literally like five minutes, uh, in five minutes, I um, start taking pictures on the corner of um, Fulton Street and Church Street, uh, where there was kind of like a triage area set up uh, by the Millennium Hotel. Uh, I also want to mention, as I was walking down Fulton Street, I noticed, uh, I saw Beth Kaiser from New York Times, and I saw Susan Watts from Daily News, and I was thinking, wow, all women. And I didn't see a, a single um, a male photographer yet. So, and, uh, you know, I got there, and I started taking photos. I... Um, I was in shock as everyone else. Uh, I remember I was um, by the Millennium Hotel and I heard somebody says that the Pentagon was hit and it was just, it just felt so surreal. Um, and uh, I was standing literally across the street when I heard the, the noise of the South Tower collapsing and I left my camera and I took one photo. I mean, I'm seeing in the viewfinder as the tower is collapsing. I took one shot um, and somebody screamed, you know, run, we were all running. I, I fell and that's the first time I was like, got really scared. Um, I was um, afraid that people were going to run over me um, and I felt really bad. And so. I looked back, um, so I'm on the ground, I looked back and I see this like tremendous 
cloud moving um, towards me on Fulton Street and there was like nowhere to hide. Um, so I hid behind a parked car and it was just, uh, it was unbelievable. Uh, it is strong wind, sharp, very sharp, strong wind. Um, you know, from blue sky, it, it went total black. And I thought I was buried, you know, alive because it just, I couldn't, you couldn't see nothing. And, um, and I couldn't hear anything, which there was, there was sound um, when I watched, uh, you know, films from that day. There, there, there was solid, uh, sound, but I, I guess I just lost hearing temporary and I couldn't see, I couldn't breathe. Um, you know, I was choking and, um, and, and then the wind kind of like was slow down and I start seeing blinking eyes, uh, blinking lights from the emergency cars. And I realized I was alive and as soon as I realized that, I started taking photos again. Um, and I, I just, later I, I changed my film. I changed the, the lens. I don't even remember doing that. I was like on autopilot. Um, but uh, looking back, I think keeping myself busy photographing, I think that kind of, saved me from going insane. I, I just imagined that I wasn't there. It's like I'm watching something horrific through the eyes of my lens, uh, like I'm in a movie or something. Uh, and then um, somebody gave me like a water and a mask and kind of snapped me out. And I, I realized I was, um, you know, I was pregnant at the time and I was just like, I gotta get out of here. And I, went back home and I start mixing chemicals because I knew AP um, didn't have um, um, develop, uh, you know, they, they didn't have opportunity the developing machine already because we were changing into the digital. So I developed my black and white film and I, that's when I noticed I had a, a roll of color film um, and so I developed my film in the bathroom and while I was developing the second uh, building collapsed um, and my building literally like shook from the, the impact. So I developed my film and I walked uh, to the office. Um, I didn't even take a shower or anything. I just started walking and um, I remember somebody said to me something that I have like something in my hair. I mean, I was all gray, like I was covered with all the, the, the dust from the World Trade Center. So I, uh, yeah, I got out to the, um, I got a call uh, actually on the landline because the cell phone wasn't working and, uh, so one of the editors um, told me to walk to the uh, other editor's apartment nearby. And so I walked there and we were drying my film in front of the fan. Uh, and then and we left to the AP at the Rockefeller Sound Center at the time. And that's when I kept myself busy, just like scanning everybody's film. Um, Oh, actually, I went to Time Life Building first to develop my color roll of color film, where I had the picture of the building collapsing. And um, so, yeah, and then I just kept myself busy uh, working. And then, um, you know, because I lived um, so close, uh, you know, that whole area was blocked. Um, I couldn't get home. And... Um, and then I was working from the W Hotel on 14th Street, uh, where AP put me in a, in a room. So, so that's where I was working, scanning, and um, but yes, it was um, it was a memorable day, uh, absolutely. 
Judith, can we put up the, the two pictures? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you can see that one, if you want to tell us yeah. about it. Yeah, so I, um, as soon as I got home, I, I ran to the bathroom uh, immediately and took a picture of myself. I just wanted to remember how I looked. Um, you know, I'm all covered in the dust. I, my elbow is bleeding. Um, you know, I'm pregnant and I still have my keys in my hand. Um, so yeah, I just took that one shot. I'm wearing a t-shirt with the American flag. I didn't even realize until later where, you know, all the, the American flag was such a symbol. Um, yeah, this photo I took, uh, you see on the left side, there's a car and that's where I was hiding. It's literally like, you know, a few meters away from the corner on Fulton and Church. Um, I, honestly, I don't remember taking this photo. It's my most famous photo. I just have no recollection. I was totally out of. Um, and uh, yeah, you can. I, 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 it's my favorite photo because it reminds me that's how I looked. Um, and, uh, you know, there, you see there are different uh, people, different national, you know, different ethnic um, um, groups of people, you know, they're white people, they're black people, they're Asian and Latino, but you know, that in that photograph, you can't really tell because we all look the same. And there's also a photo of the building collapsing, actually, this I have this here. And it's a black and white, but the original photo is in color. Yeah. Oh. And did you take the cover one too? Is that one also yours, the one on the cover? Oh, yeah, in the middle, yeah, it's myself. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so we, we had to fight to get <laughs> photos in the book because the publishers were like, that costs a lot of money. And we were like, I don't care. The photos are the most really important. So we had several, some, some different ones. Um, okay, so I, I do want to ask um, Beth and, and Glenera especially about health effects, because uh, we've heard so much uh, about the firefighters and, and the police who've had lung issues um, or other sorts of things. And um, and and I I don't I don't know Emily maybe there was some of that in in um, Pennsylvania as well but so what about that have, did you personally have to um, you know get some treatments and 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 did you have any lasting effects from breathing the the uh, the debris that was coming in I'm very lucky that I did not have any lasting effects we relocated for about two weeks to the NPR bureau in Midtown. And I didn't keep going all the way downtown like some of my other colleagues. So I, I mean, my home was downtown, but it was not close enough that I was really breathing it every day. I remember a police officer giving me a mask and I was wearing that a bit. Um, I think much more I was affected psychologically. It was very upsetting and my colleagues and I talked about it a lot. The station brought in a Red Cross, I think it was Red Cross um, kind of crisis counseling team to have all the news people sit in a room together and talk about how we were feeling. This was, I don't know, maybe like 10 days later or more. And it was really good because to a person, everyone said they didn't think they had done enough or there was more they could have done that day because they were so freaked out. And we were all just doing our best, you know, but still people were very hard on themselves about what, what else we could have done. I should have stayed longer or I should have talked to that person some more or, you know, oh, I can't believe I wasted time when I should have, you know, gone over there. You know, it, it was a lot of second guessing, which was hard. And uh, I felt very lucky that um, my employer thought of that. And also the federal government had a program to pay for healthcare costs, psychological and physical. And, you know, my friends and I were able to take advantage of it to varying degrees. As far as the, the firefighters and 
the other first responders and people down there. I did do a lot of reporting on the firefighters about for the six months anniversary, we did um, we did a special, like an hour long special on, um, I think the theme was really mental health and trauma, but I spent about a week with a firehouse where I think they lost nine guys that day. And the effect that it had on the people who were survivors and how they rallied to each person partnered with a family member of somebody who died, which is a tradition in the in the FDNY, and meeting this one really nice guy who kept going to Long Island to visit with the mom of one of his colleagues who died and seeing how you know they kind of took care of each other, but also some of them were clearly drinking too much. They were going to so many funerals. They were not looking too good. So that that's something that I I saw um, at the time. But it's um, it's going to do a lot of damage to people in different ways. And the family members of the people who died, I continued reporting on them when they were asking for whether it was more investigations of how the buildings collapsed. I was reporting on that a lot. Um, you know, how to make uh, skyscrapers safer, safer and things like that and, and what design elements could have been a little different. Um, there were other family members lobbying for all kinds of other things having to do with security. And these people were, I got the feeling very damaged and the work is what kept them going even to the point where it wasn't healthy but they needed an outlet. And it was often tough to, to watch and to talk to them because I felt like, oh God, you shouldn't be talking to me. You should be talking to somebody else. You, you really need some help. But then other people handled it in really tremendous ways and gave so much of themselves and created lasting monuments and scholarships. You know, it brought out so many things in people. Um, yeah, and let me say too, before um, I ask Golnera about that, but um, uh, we, Suzanne and I did all of our interviews over the phone, <laughs> and um, it was pretty remarkable to me that most of the people I interviewed, at least, had not talked to anybody outside of their uh, colleagues, or maybe a few um, had gotten some, you know, a little bit of the professional help. And, and there was kind of this sense that I've, I've seen it just in journalists in, in general, that they were a little bit um, afraid to talk about how they were feeling because they didn't want to get pulled off the story or they didn't want to, um, you know, because they were women, they didn't want to be looked at as being weaker than their male counterparts. They wanted to keep covering the story and did so. And I think was a real turning point in a lot of ways with journalism, and we'll talk about that again in a minute too, but Golnera, but, let's but, talk about you and- But and I, I wanna mention- really, oh, sorry. I wanna mention one thing about why, you know, it was hard to travel and that's when the anthrax was delivered to NBC and CNN wouldn't let anybody in. I mean, it, it, it wasn't normal. Even months later when we were working on this book, um, we couldn't like go there. Right. Right, and actually, I, I I don't know about, I think, Suzanne, you and I both were there for the first time on the second anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, we went for the that conference, and that's when I walked around and actually, first time I'd been in New York, so it was the first time I actually was able to go to the places that they were, had told me about and see right. for sure where it was, so it was kind of different. Anyway, um, <laughs> Golnero. You want to talk about the yes um, emotional um well <clears throat> in my case i um you know i also lived uh right down there and i had to see the the pile as we called it you know going to the subway on fulton street and you know seeing the pile and walking on this like uh, street uh, full of debris steel and, and 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 it's all wet and you feel it and you smell it um you know you go to the subway it's it, it just and then you get to the office and you go through every frame that ap photographers and freelancers took 
um, because I was a special um, special projects photo editor where we would um, look for photographs for exhibitions and books and publications and contests and awards and and it's just I think you know 9/11 was quite traumatizing for me in so many levels but also looking at all those photographs for a year you know you go to the office and you look at them all day long <clears throat> it was like I, I was crying almost every day it was just um very traumatizing i and i also uh, uh, lost the baby um shortly after so to me it was just yeah, I kept busy, you know, I kept myself busy working, um, but it was, you know, mental health. I mean, yeah, I was talking to, yeah, we were all in the same boat. I mean, we were all talking to each other and, um, you know, everybody was understanding uh, what everyone was going through. Um, but yeah, working in the news, is like when you have the television 24 seven covering 9-11, it's just, you know, you go home, you see it, you smell it. Um, it, it was just, um, I, I did, um, yeah, the Red Cross uh, was very helpful. Um, and uh, the, uh, we also, I don't know, I don't think it's right away, but I am part of the monitoring um, on the Mount Sinai Hospital. And every year they monitor, they do all the tests. Um, I do have few issues um health issues um but you know i'm pretty healthy um in you know i'm in my opinion <laughs> um well, what else um yeah i because you know i photographed that day i mean that uh, i looking back i think see you know the next day my photographs were like in every newspaper, magazine, television. It, I think it helped me to overcome the, the depression and um, the stress of it because I felt proud of what I did that day. I had no like regrets. Oh, I should have stayed or I should have went that corner or this corner. I don't have this. I'm quite proud of the photographs I um, took that day and uh, um, you know, the awards I received and, uh, and, you know, 20 years later, it's, you know, my photographs still stand, you know, still memorable. And every year it's been, you know, published. And um, so, yeah, I have, I'm proud of what I did that day. Um, and I, I have realized you know, that now I'm having generations of students who don't have any memory of it at all. And that was one of the reasons we went into write the book was for 20 years later, 50 years later, 100 years later, uh, to say how they actually covered it, how it was covered um, that day. And then, uh, Emily, you just recently went back to, you said to um, the um, center in, in, um, in Pennsylvania, how was, how was that for you? It was it was uh, moving. I hadn't been back since um, my time at that station. And shortly after 9-11, I um, got a job at a new station probably about nine months later. So even at the one year anniversary, I was somewhere else. I wasn't even uh, in Altoona anymore reporting. So and I'm a Pennsylvania girl like I'm from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, uh, the northwest part of the state, but I had never been back in all of those years. And I, I, um, I, I, I always kind of shied away from it. I don't know. I, I, maybe it's because it, you know, there were such tough memories um, associated with it. But going back um, for this twenty year, my old station invited me back um, along with what the uh, the one other reporter that was uh, really had covered it a lot, um, covered that day a lot. In the weeks following, and uh, so it was, it was, it was really. Um, I, don't, I don't know if "lovely" is the right word. Um, healing. It, it just it was a moment of coming full circle of of walking with this other colleague and looking, and it was it was a bit surreal, and it was so peaceful um, this time around. And you know, twenty years ago, you know, you could smell the jet fuel, and and there was just 
you know, you could see the smoke and there was the, the trees littered with paper and they were burned and, you know, to see the families coming in on the buses. I mean, it was, it was traumatic to watch and, um, you know, to, to see that, that level of pain and the, and the first responders. But 20 years later, um, I mean, this site is really beautiful, what they've, what they've done with it. It's, it's, um, it's peaceful. I think that those families, you know, the families of, of Flight 93, they've, they've done an amazing job with, um, you know, uh, working with the government to, to put together just a, just a beautiful, beautiful memorial. So it was, a, um, it was a good, it was a good experience. I was glad that I, that I did it. I wasn't sure if I should, but it, it was good. And, and to the point of, you know, did you, you know, uh, talk to anyone or mental health issues, you know, I think in small market TV, I don't know that my bosses or the company at that time was even thinking about that um, for us. I don't, I, and I mean, maybe that's a function of, you know, just a small, you know, working at a smaller, a smaller station. So that was not, uh, that was not offered. So I would have to say that just talking with my mom, you know, over the years and, and, you know, some close friends and stuff is, is what I've done. Okay. Um, I want to kind of switch the focus a little bit now and have each of you um, offer some advice to students about, you know, how to prepare, if, you, if it's possible to prepare. And I've, hopefully, you know, we never have anything quite as horrendous as 9-11, but we've had plenty of horrendous things still. Um, maybe weren't as long of enduring, but certainly those of us in Louisiana have had our share of of hurricane damage and flooding and things like that, that, that do have some lingering effects. Um, but, um, but what, you know, what did you learn from your experience that you'd like to pass on to students? And I know Beth, you're, you're um, doing educational things now. Um, so you might wanna talk about that a little bit and, and what, um, what you're hoping to accomplish in, in the education realm now. Well, I covered education off and on for most of my time at WNYC until Trump was elected. And then I was covering immigration and criminal justice. And then the pandemic happened. And then I left at, in October of last year. I'm working for a, a foundation that's working to improve high schools. So it was just a, a unique combination of they wanted somebody who could tell stories about um, what was happening in the schools that they fund. And I was looking to leave the news business. And since I felt pretty comfortable in the education space and they knew my work and we may launch a podcast, you know, they were thinking ambitiously about what I could do for them. So that's, that's that, you know, that's how I got hired. But um, I hadn't really thought about leaving until last year. I thought I, I'd have a few more years in me, but I think I was especially around the 20th anniversary, it really got me thinking like, I have done it. <laughs> and I even sort of consciously decided to tell my story last year, more than in previous years to, you know, let myself be interviewed by different places to, I was in a documentary that was um, about journalists who covered it, that was done for, um, it's not Wondery, I'm spacing on the name, but, it's uh, it's an educational documentary network. Um, they did a fabulous job. And if you come back to me, I will give you the name of this documentary because it, it was really, really well done about journalism. And the thing that I think about now when giving advice to, to journalists, future journalists, you really just have to follow your curiosity and your humanity when you're in a situation like that. What are you curious about? What do you think is happening to those people? Go talk to them because they'll tell you if they don't feel comfortable talking, but in a lot of times they want to talk, they want to have their story told. So don't feel like you're being ghoulish. You know, I, I felt very uncomfortable approaching people who had just gone through something horrific that day. And if they didn't want to talk to me, they made it known. But then there were many people who, one woman was even saying, if I talk on the radio now, my friends will know I'm alive. And then the other piece of advice I would say is journalism has changed a lot to the point where everybody's a, a storyteller. You know, everybody wants to have their own podcast. Everybody's on Twitter or doing something with social media and making it more about them and their view of things. And at the time that was very, no, 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 no. 
I mean, when I turned on my recorder and recorded myself narrating what was happening, that was not a typical thing for me to do. Now it's much more typical and people will go someplace and you know, every podcast you hear, okay, I'm testing the microphone now. Can you hear me? Oh, the door just slammed. And it gets kind of um, cliched, but there's also a good reason to do it because sometimes it does work to put yourself in that story and to be there as, as somebody bearing witness and to tell what you are seeing, it can work. You just don't overdo it. So when I look back, I kind of wish that I had turned that recorder on a little bit earlier I'm glad I did, but if I was thinking like a young person today or a new journalist today, I would have had that thing on from the moment I left the house. And then it would have been too much about me. So, you know, you gotta strike that balance. Emily, you had some thoughts too. Um, we talked about um, that, um, about how you, it's, it's uh, you have to be a one, a one person band <laughs> a lot. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, that's one way the industry has changed quite a bit in, in, in broadcast where, you know, at the time when I worked in Altoona, I, I had a cameraman every day. And now when I went back there um, to visit those, those folks, they are now working, they're doing it all on their own. And uh, I'm trying to imagine that day uh, and those weeks to follow going and doing it on my own. I, I mean, I hope they in that moment would have had the good sense to send me with someone, but, you know, maybe not because nowadays it's about, um, oh, I don't know. I, I, I mean, it's the, the corporations are saving money, right. By having people do it all on their own. And so that's what it's about. Um, which is, you know, if I can say pretty disappointing, um, to see it trend that way. I think that, um, I think that not only is it a safety issue, uh, as we saw last week in West Virginia, when the young woman got hit by a car, uh, I think that's a problem that is a safety issue, but I do think quality suffers. Um, and I know some folks that do do it on their own and they do a fabulous job, but the thing is, it's so nice to have a partner and a second set of eyes to watch your back. And especially in a situation like that day and, and those weeks, I mean, I, I hope they would have had the, the good sense to um to partner people up but uh i don't know i mean I, I i just don't know so um if this if that would happen today uh you would probably see a lot of folks uh, you know out there on their own and i think you so you know just every it's like everybody can go live on facebook right so i think you would have seen a lot of folks just everybody's kind of freestyling it live on facebook and i and i think that the, the way social media has gone, I mean, we still have a responsibility um, to, to, to check the facts and not put out something there that's not confirmed yet. And I think it's kind of been the wild, wild west uh, in the past few years with, with social media. So I would, I, I, I don't know what it would be like uh, today. I, I still want to, you know, I'm old school that way. I want to, I want to confirm stuff. Now, you know, in that moment, there was, there was not necessarily you couldn't necessarily get through to get anything confirmed. So it was just kind of talking about what you saw and, 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 and here's what I'm witnessing. And, you know, we're still waiting for answers and that kind of thing. And I think if you're a trained journalist, you know, that that's what you're supposed to do. But if you're not, and you're just going live on Facebook and, 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 and you don't know about confirming things necessarily, who knows what you're, what you're putting out there. And that's when, um, I mean, I think we're at a time in human history and journalism where we can't get it wrong more than ever um, because, um, you know, the, the, the public trust is, uh, it's a, a lot of folks don't trust journalists anymore. Um, and uh, so, I mean, we have a responsibility more than ever to um, get it right. But I, 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 as far as lessons, I mean, I think, um, uh, like Beth said, you know, follow, follow your curiosity um, and, and, and you do have to bring your humanity to the table. And uh, I know in those early days, it was hard for me to approach people going through um, some kind of loss, but I have found over the years that people often, they, they, they want to talk, they want to share. Uh, I just think you have to be responsible about it and know, you know, where people are, are traumatized. And, and, and so you have to, um, you know, bring your humanity to it, certainly, and, and put yourself in their shoes. And um, uh, I think people, I think people respect that. I think that they sense when you're, when you're real and you're genuine and uh, they, they open up to you if they feel comfortable. Okay. Um, and so, Galnera, I, again, I've kind of saved you for last here because you've really built a career on your own. <laughs> 
Um, you've been all over the world and um, you, you just mentioned the book that you've had published and through the years I've seen, you know, different photographs from you and things that you've done. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about how you put your career together and how you went from working for the AP in the capacity that you were doing into really just being quite willing to um, to be, I, I don't know if freelancing is quite the right word, but to build your own career. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I actually quit AP uh, one year after 9-11. I just couldn't handle the stress of it. And I um, opened my own business in wedding photography. So I just went completely opposite. I just wanted to see happy people, people who want me to be there. And so I built a very successful business, um, but it came to the point where I was just not very happy. Uh, I just wanted to do my own thing. You know, I wanted to... Um, you know, the 9-11, the it's like, it's really made me realize how much I wanted to do something meaningful and meaningful in my own way. So, um, you know, after I built a business, I actually, um, you know, start thinking like how, it's just not that's something that I wanted to do to the rest of my life. And so I, I, I wanted to um, work on my own art. I wanted to be an artist. And, you know, I've been doing photography since I was 15. It's like 40, over 40 years. And so I wanted to go back to the roots of being an artist. And, uh, and then, you know, with the election happened and it just really fired me into, um, I got really affected by the many actions of uh, president-elect. And I just thought I wanted to do something for uh, women photographers. And that's when I had an idea to create a group exhibition of women street photographers. And it just took off. I became <laughs> became this global phenomena you know I, I, on Instagram on social media and I create curated um yeah I became like a accidental curator because uh looking uh, all this like when I started women's street photographers I did not know any other women's street photographers so it just researching on on social media and and then the the reason I opened I started the Instagram account it's as my own catalog where I could uh, save uh, work by female photographers. And um, just little by little, you know, I started writing captions and then I curated my first exhibition uh, in New York City at the art space. And then I just start curating all these exhibitions around the world. Um, and, um, and then I got a book offer from Pristel um and it that was exciting i mean i was already thinking to do a book and but pristel did such a great job um and uh, yeah so it was it, 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 yeah so it's a, it's an amazing journey i um right now um you know during the pandemics i you know i can't travel really although i do i managed to still curate exhibitions in other countries um, but now I'm working, like I'm creating virtual exhibitions and, um, I am actually working on my next book. So yeah, I'm pretty busy. This is, this is something exciting. This is something, you know, I met so many wonderful people, uh, and, uh, you know, it's a, you know, I have a purpose in life and that's what drives me to, to continue with this. It's, it's exciting. Like, this has actually pulled me out of my depression. Like, I was so unhappy with what I was doing. And, um, you know, I'm still suffering with PTSD. And it's just, you know, when you're helping other people, when you're doing something that is purposeful, it's really, it really helped 
me with my mental uh, state of mind. Let's put it this way. Yeah. Can Can you explain what you mean by street photographers? Uh, street photographers is the genre um, where you take photos on you know on the on the street or in a village road or um so in my you know in my opinion it's such an open um it's such a wide uh meaning of street photography but something that is unstaged and um sometimes it could be borderline between like documentary or photojournalism you know because you are on the street you you may capture some moments um and uh you know street portraits i consider as a, also part of the street photography, something that brings joy. <laughs> yes, that's really important. <laughs> as I get older, I find it more important all the time is to, to look for that joy, that, that spark that yeah. makes life worth living. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So Suzanne, did you want to uh, ask them any questions or add anything to what they were saying? Because since you're more professionally backgrounded than I than I was, <laughs> at least in broadcast. Well, I, I did want to say um, the book, um, a hard um, hardcover and um, paper cover is in the, the 9-11 Museum in the in New York in their collection. Um, I approached them about accepting, and they did. Um, so it is in the uh, collection there. And I'm just grateful for everyone um, sharing their their story because if, if you, I reread it a couple of days ago in preparation for this, and, and just the amount of detail and Im immediacy, and I mean, it still sends chills that that this, the stories capture, I mean, what the women told us captured what, what it was like. And like Judith said, the students in our classes now have, they have no memory of it. Be, well, most of them were born yet. And even the ones that were young, um, they didn't want to traumatize them by teaching them about it. Um, so it is a, a written record. and. We're just grateful for everybody who shared um, with us. So. Yeah, yeah, and I, I have to um, say too that I was extremely honored that um, after um, the the ship, the USS New York, um, was built from uh, metal out of the World Trade Center. It was built in New Orleans, and after they were getting ready to launch it, I got a call from this very New York man. <laughs> his accent was on my machine and I had to call him back and he said we'd really like to get some copies of your book to put on the ship because he said most of the people most of the young men or and women who are going to be on this ship don't really know what happened that day so it's really important to us to have your book in the library and I was just blown away by that I still have his message to me on my answering machine tape I just I can't I can't um, erase it um, and so you know it's all those kinds of things that kind of made this important um, and I, I I mean I've always thought it was important but I think other people have recognized too how important it, it is in terms of doing all of that and Suzanne and I did some interviews um, after the book came out actually on the first anniversary um, I flew from um, I can't remember if it was Baton Rouge or New Orleans to Dallas because we were, and I was the only person on the plane. <laughs> and when we landed in Dallas, there were no taxis, there were, were no people. And they were like, everybody was afraid, afraid to fly on the first anniversary. They were afraid there was going to be something. So that was when I started to kind of get a sense of how, um, how um, difficult it was to really focus and know what was going on because it just was so surreal to be in that situation. And then the second anniversary we were in New York. So I have really vivid memories of that, but I have tried, if I have a class on 9-11, on I have tried to read excerpts from the book and I usually close with Beth's final line where she was talking about walking home and 
just how sad it was. And um, I, I try to convey that, you know, to the students about that it was really sad. It was just a really sad, difficult um, um, months and years, really, in a lot of ways. And so I'm, I'm always a little bit triggered on the anniversary because, you know, somebody's going to put something back up on TV and so on and so forth to see that. So uh, I've, I've often wondered, that's when I think about all the ladies in my, in our book and wondering how they're doing, um, how they're coping and um, why I looked up a lot of them to see where they were and what they were doing. And um, the interesting thing to me is that almost all the photographers um, actually did go into wedding photography for a while <laughs> or are, are not, they're, they're, they worked for AP for a while, some of them, and then they were just like, I'm out of here. And um, Suzanne Plunkett and I've been in contact somewhat, and she was one of the photographers, and um, she is actually based in London now, and she's been doing a lot of kind of freelance things, but she did join a, a wedding photography group for a little while, but she also um, was involved in shooting photographs for um, uh, out of Afghanistan when, you know, we pulled out the way we did. Um, and it left a lot of journalists behind who'd been covering um, that either, um, you know, local country wise or people who'd been there for a long time covering it and chose to stay. And um, so they had a, a, a fundraiser, I guess you could say, where they had some photographs from photographers uh, in Afghanistan that they were selling. And I got a couple of them. And one of them was Suzanne's um, picture of a couple of girls swinging in the mountains or in the background. It's just a remarkable photo. Um, so there's, there's definitely ways that we can still support journalists who are still covering crisis and still in those, those, those uh, things. So there's journalists without borders, and then there's the photographers. So all of that's good too. Um, all right. So do we have some questions from the audience, Kelsey? I guess there's some things in the chat here. Um, okay. This one for Emily. How did you report for 9/11 so early in your career? Help prepare you for the rest of your career. So you might want to just reiterate that just a bit. Um, well, I, I, I think, I mean, I think it's when I realized that, you know, anything can happen, um, at any time. So it was a good lesson in always having kind of a, a run bag next to the door, quite frankly, with stuff, um, um, always packed. Um, I think, you know, um, like I said before, it was my first large scale um, tragedy uh, that I had ever covered. I'd only been reporting three years, um, you know, by the time I, I, I was in Altoona. So um, I, I think it prepared me uh, to uh, approach, I mean, I've had to approach a lot of people then over the years who have on the worst day of their lives. And that was the worst day of people's lives, you know, across the world. And, um, so I think it it, it 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 prepared me to 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 know how to approach people and also how to focus. Um, how to uh, you can have a million things going on in in your life or a million feelings about what's going on, but at the end of the day, you have a job that you have to get done. So you just I don't know. Uh, you learn to to function on autopilot in the moment. Uh, so it prepared me to be able to do that. And we've talked a bit about how journalism has changed. Um, but I, I also want to say, too, that I think uh, that there's still a lot of male <laughs> males in charge <laughs> of the news. But there are more women news directors now than there's ever been before, I believe. Um, and the other thing <laughs> that we were asked, that Suzanne and I were asked when we were doing our, our book promotion tour, I guess you'd say, that always, that's a male, it would always be a male who would ask us, how did the women cover this differently than a male would? And I thought about that for a little bit. And I, and I, you know, ended up saying, look, they were professional. It, I don't think there was any difference in the way they covered it. But what I have come to decide <laughs> is, um, and that was really after looking at a lot of the collections that we had, was that the women that day were obviously performing on a very professional level. 
but there was also quite a bit of concern about family members. Some of them had kids. They were worried about where their kids were. And, and, and some of them were worried about parents. And I, I remember one person said she managed to call her, her father and he didn't answer. So she left this kind of goodbye message to him on her answering machine. And then after she got, you know, got through everything was still fine. She was like, I was really sorry I did that because I knew he was really worried and I couldn't get back to him. And I don't know that men kind of internalize it quite that way. I'm not saying they, they don't any of them, but I felt like men just kind of are, you know, let's go out and get this story and not even be thinking on some part of their brain, how's my wife or how, how are my kids or, you know, how's my, my great friends who maybe are around there. And so I think that was kind of a difference um, in the way that women approached it, but I don't think it really affected how they covered it. I mean, I just remember one anecdote from Ann Compton who was, um, she had called her husband to say she was fine. She was on Air Force One with the president. And it occurred to her later, I'm on the only plane in the sky. You know, maybe that wasn't such a good, you know, comforting thought to call and say, but she, at some point, she was able to call and say, I'm on Air Force One and that's where yeah, I and I think that's important that we got, uh, and you got that interview, and I thought that was such an important interview to have, um, because she was the only woman on the plane, and, um, <laughs> but ironically, she was at ABC, I think, at the time, and I saw a little clip from ABC the, of their coverage, and there was men, 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 and then Anne. <laughs> I was like, I'd really like to use her clip, but we'd have to edit it because I don't want all these men in there um, talking before she did. So there's, there's still some, you know, things like that. But I think about all the women now who are um, anchoring shows on NBC, MSNBC and CNN and um, I guess Fox and, you know, some of these other, I mean, you just see so many more women in those yeah. positions of decision-making and deciding yeah. what to cover than maybe there was before. But I'm not saying it's perfect. Um, but I, I do think that's that's happening. Has it made a difference in coverage? I, I don't I don't know. You know if it's different in coverage, but I I think that it's um, certainly opened up the field for um, you know more progress for women than we were definitely seeing 20 years ago until um, this happened. Mm -hmm. Did any of you want to comment on that? Did do you agree with me or? Do you see it differently? Oh, okay. Um, well, Kelsey asked about resources. And I, I wanna say to you that at the end of our book, <laughs> we added um, DART from the DART Center information for journalists um, to recognize when they were being traumatized, which is kind of remarkable back then that we had to say, this is how you can recognize it. Um, I think now it's pretty recognizable. <laughs> back then it was kind of new. And um, the DART Center actually, after Katrina hit, the DART Center sent a team to the Times-Picayune people who had, you know, had to abandon New Orleans and ha had another whole story there. Um, but they would go in and talk to reporters um, and, and just kind of help them with things and make, especially make management more aware that they needed to be flexible with people. Like, well, with Katrina, there were people who lost their homes. And so, you know, the boss just had to be able to say to them, okay, go, go take care of your house. Um, you know, take the day and, and take care of whatever you need to do. That would not have happened, I don't think, um, before we started seeing so much trauma happening <laughs> so rapidly. Uh, and so there, that was one thing I think that's, that's different. Um, and I don't know about other resources exactly. I know that, I just know, I mean, I would say the Dark Center is still probably the best place, the most experienced place. Um, and I know they've been in place since, I believe the Oklahoma City bombing was what um, mm -hmm. kind of spurred them to put some things together. And uh, uh, it stands for something and I forgot now what it is, but it's capital B, A, capital A, capital R, capital T. Um, and it's the DART Center. And um, 
But I, I, I just want to say too, I really wish that all of you would read our book because these are just a few of the stories. Um, and, you know, I wanted to really have an event where we had everybody and of course that couldn't happen. And then thanks to COVID, we couldn't even do it live um, in person. So, um, you know, there's still a lot there, but there's just some wonderful stories in that, in that book. I just may add, um... I just want to say that your interview, you know, when you called me and you interviewed, it's like you, you were the first person who I told my story, you know, like with, in the, such a detail. Because um, at the time, I didn't think it was important, you know, that I developed my own film. Uh, and, uh, and I didn't really share uh, my story um like fully like publicly until this 20th anniversary because people typically every year they would be interested in my photos and i would every year i would be busy you know sending my photos here and there um, but this year i had so much interest in my own personal story which made me realize that all of us have like mm -hmm. such an incredible stories like looking back and you know, 20 years later, there's there's so many things that just incredible. I want to add, it's I felt like it was very important to tell my story of it because there's so much misinformation now and conspiracy theories. I had the conspiracy theorists coming after me years ago, and I didn't even I wasn't aware of it until like 2009. I was doing a Google search when I wrote a book about education and I came across other books, which are no longer, they're no longer linked to on Amazon. So I think they've shut it down, but there were a whole bunch of like truth or conspiracies books that were quoting me on the air on NPR because I had said when I was watching the buildings come down, it resembled a controlled demolition. And they were using my words to, you know, back up their claim that the government brought down the buildings. And so we did a segment on the public radio show on the media where I was interviewed about how strange it was to see my words misquoted that way, especially when I had been covering the federal investigation of the building collapse because they were looking at the steel, you know, to investigate exactly how the buildings came down to design better buildings in the future. So, you know, I had no doubt about what happened, but that people would be using my words this way was very, very upsetting as a journalist. And so for us to tell our stories is also, you know, teaching people something in first person accounts <laughs> from reputable sources, I hope. And I also hope that when you're teaching your journalism classes, I mean, by college, probably too late, which is why we talk about this with the high schools that I'm working with, you know, how do you, how do you do a project where you know everything is, is truthful and accurate, you know, like we want to do a student journalism project now for the schools, but it's so important that young people growing up distinguish between what is a legit source and what is just somebody spewing whatever they think. And then that gets in the mess of things and nobody knows what the difference is. Right. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's... My, my, my photos were just part of all this conspiracy theories as well. Oh, you had it too? Oh my God, I Googled myself too and, and it's just unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. They were analyzing my photos and that they were fake photos and or oh. it's just, I don't even want to repeat, but yeah, I went through the same, same, yeah. Yeah, and Emily, there were conspiracy theories early on that the government had shot down that plane. You know, that that was one of the things. And, and I mean, there was some maybe factual reason for thinking that could happen, right. but, but it, it didn't take too long for that to be dispelled but I suppose there's still plenty of people out there who still think that's what happened. Plenty and plenty who asked me, so when we're covering it, did you ever talk to somebody that thought that it, you know, one, one of the neighbors or the people in the town that saw something da, 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 and I say, no, you know, as, as we know, you know, there was discussion about that, but they didn't end up having to do that because the, you know, the folks on board, it, it, it crashed before that decision ever had to be made. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, the conspiracy theories, I mean, 
this is where we are now. This is where we are now that uh, people really, really um, take heed of those things and, and listen to them, which is why, you know, our job is so, so vital. Oh my gosh, I, I've never felt more of a heavy responsibility on my shoulders to, to do this job and to, you know, to always get it right. Of course, you're always trying to get it right. And, um, but yeah, it's a heavy responsibility given, uh, you know, what we see going on the rise of, you know, Q conspiracies and I mean, you can name them all off. Yeah. Yeah, it's really um, quite remarkable. And that was one of my driving forces for writing that book. It's because I felt like we would get it before there was revisionist history, um, that we would get the, 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 the first draft of history, <laughs> right. really the first book of history, uh, and why I'm so proud of it, because I, I think it holds up very well in terms of really dispelling anything else other than this is what happened that day, and this is how journalists covered it, and also journalists were, were at that point especially bad about explaining their process and how they were getting stories and what they were doing and uh, how it was affecting them personally, and, you know, we've come a long way maybe too far um, on the other opposite way on that. But at the same time, I think it was just so important to capture it and to do it as quickly as we did, because we could have spent, you know, two or three years doing it. Or, and and it, it just wouldn't have, it just wouldn't have been the same. And we, we really did get the cooperation of some pretty, um, you know, pretty major people. Um, um, Mika Brzezinski, um, whatever she's going by now, uh, is in that book. And uh, I, I actually had, had some hope earlier on that she might join us. She's actually in Poland right now. So that wasn't going anywhere. Um, but nevertheless, you know, we had some people that are still really like Judy Woodruff that are still just tops in the field or recognized in the field. And, um, you know, and, and they were willing to talk to us and and as I said, in many cases, we were the first people uh, outside of colleagues that they had had talked to. And by the way, my technique was to just simply start every interview by saying, oh, what did you plan to do that morning and what did you do? And it was remarkable how everybody had plans, you know? I mean, they were, some of them were in bed, but you know, nevertheless, it was like everybody had plans of what they were going to do that day, and it was that beautiful, sunny, beautiful day, and they just, you know, and then wow, this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and then I, you know, and then they would start to tell me their stories, and um, and I, I just, I still just, I just think the women that are in our book, all of you are so brave, <laughs> we're so brave, continue to be brave. Um, continue to be just top-notch people um, that I'm proud that you were in our book and um, proud to have kind of followed you through the years in many cases. Um, and so that that is a truly remarkable thing. So any closing thoughts? Well, I believe we're about out of time. So Kelsey, did you want to wrap things up? Sure. Um, well, thank you, Judith, and, and thank you, Suzanne and Gonara and Beth and Emily, um, so much for spending some time with us today, kind of reliving a little bit of this. I know it's it's definitely hard to do, um, even now, 20 years later. Um, but I did want to say thank you to all of you for sharing your stories, not just a part of the book, but for today as well. Um, so we've recorded today's video and that, that recording will go up live on the Manship Schools YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And you can also find it on the Riley Center's website at lsureilycenter.com. Um, we're gonna include some of the resources mentioned, including a link to the book and where you can get it. Um, on that on our website as well as in the description box of the YouTube video. Um, our next event will be Common Ground Local News and Political Coverage on February 8th at 3.30 p.m. on Zoom. Um, and the event is going to feature Manship School Associate Professor Dr. Josh Darr, whose latest research analyzes what happens when newsrooms shift coverage of politics from the national lens to local issues. 
You can find the register link uh, for this event on the lsureilycenter.com uh, website and also on Eventbrite if you search the name of the event, Common Ground, Local News, and Political Coverage. Um, so thank you again all for joining us. We really appreciate having you here and we hope to see you at future Riley Center events. Have a great afternoon, everyone.